We'll continue our worship now by joining in together and singing our hymn of preparation, which is number 219, He Leadeth Me. Hitler and all these 
but in reality unsaved is unsaved and for eternity the unsaved will end up in the same place that's why we'll look at the death of Jezebel today as is told in the pages of scripture and we'll look at what that means for the average person who doesn't have saving faith in Jesus we find this story in the Old Testament book of 2 Kings and we'll read in chapter 9 from verses 30 through 37 if you're following along in your pew Bible you'll find it on page 267 and beginning in 2 Kings 9 verse 30 the word of the Lord says then Jehu went to Jezreel when Jezebel heard about it she painted her eyes arranged her hair and looked out of a window as Jehu entered the gate she asked have you come in peace Zimri you murderer of the master he looked up at the window and called out who is on my side who two or three eunuchs looked down at him throw her down Jehu said so they threw her down and some of her blood spattered the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot Jehu went in and ate and drank take care of that cursed woman he said and bury her for she was a king's daughter but when they went to bury her they found nothing except her skull her feet and her hands they went back and told Jehu who said this is the word of the Lord that he uh, spoke through his servant Elijah the Tishbite on the plot of ground at Jezreel dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh Jezebel's body will be like the refuse on the ground in the plot at Jezreel so that no one will be able to say this is Jezebel and the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word Amen. last week we looked at Jezebel and specifically her relationship with King Ahab and I'm not going to rehash all that today but I do want to focus on Jezebel and add that in this additional passage uh, there's another one that really uh, coincides with this really well and uh, you don't have to turn there but I want to read for you 1 Kings 16 just looking at verses 30 through 33 and that says Ahab who was Jezebel's husband the son of Omri did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat but he also married Jezebel the daughter of Ethbaal king of the Sidonians and began to serve Baal and worship him he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord the God of Israel than did all the kings of Israel before him the first reference in this passage about Jezebel tells us who her father was and his name is Ethbaal sort of an odd name we don't see that name anymore if you're familiar at all with the false gods of the Old Testament you come across names such as Ashtoreth, Beelzebub, and Baal. Well, take that last one, Baal. He is one of the more popular ones that the Israelites gravitated towards. He was a Canaanite god. So the name of Jezebel's father, Eth Baal, means worshiper of Baal. And Jezebel followed in the footsteps of her father also worshiping Baal I'm sure you're familiar that in the culture of the times a person's name often referred to something of the character of that person or it hinted at something that he or she did such as with with uh, F Baal he worshiped Baal so that was his name and along those lines what would you suppose the name Jezebel means well if you're like me you would expect the name of the most evil woman in all of scripture to have a name that reflects her true character but in this case you would actually be mistaken 
See, the name Jezebel means chaste or free from carnal connection. Not what we think of when we think of Jezebel. We think of the exact opposite. And uh, Jezebel's name points to something much deeper, though. And uh, it tells us, really does tell us a lot about her. Now, I'm going to explain this by pointing you towards a New Testament passage I'm sure you've heard a bunch of times. It says, The devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The Bible also tells us to beware because even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. That's what Jezebel does through her name. She disguises herself as something that she isn't. At first, she disguises herself by her name, and then she does so in another way that we'll get to a little later. And that is exactly what the enemy, Satan, does. He doesn't ever come right out and reveal himself to us. He camouflages himself so that he can get into places where he doesn't belong. Just as Jezebel weaseled her way into the palace of the king of Israel, Satan weasels himself into places he shouldn't be, such as the church. Because of this, those in the church can't always point our finger at those who sit home on Sunday morning because some of the people who cling to most of their sin are in church every Sunday morning as well. Jezebel is a picture of a sinner without Jesus Christ. This person is so self-centered, power-hungry, and vain. Really, think about this. What does a person have in life if you don't have Jesus Christ? True. We all have these things in the world, but none of the things here, material things, are eternal. It's been said that the believer in Christ will not experience a hell that is worse than their life on earth, meaning it will never get worse for them as it is now. On the other hand, the sinner will never experience a heaven better than their life here on earth, because after they take their last breath, it will never be this good again. Okay. Is this all that a person wants in life? I know I sure don't. I want a lot more than this. Without Christ, a person lives every day trying to ignore the fact that their time of pleasure in life is quickly drawing to an end. And the time will come when they will experience the results of the choice that they have made to continually reject Jesus Christ. When that proverbial sand in the hourglass runs out, then all bets are off because... These people will be thrown into what the Bible calls a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They'll be joining the likes of Jezebel and all the millions of others who have rejected Jesus Christ. You see, Jezebel is a picture of the person who lives their life without Christ, but there's also a lot more to it than that. The self-centered nature and vanity of Jezebel is seen in verse 30 where it says then Jehu went to Jezreel when Jezebel heard about it she put on eye makeup arranged her hair and looked out a window on the day that Jezebel died we read that she was dolling herself up putting on makeup and fixing her hair to look as good as she could there's several suggestions as to what she's really doing here one expert I looked at said she was preparing her body for her burial, knowing that she would die soon. But honestly, I'm not so sure about that. Um, when a person lives their life as Jezebel did, they become addicted to power, and they are so selfish and that because they're separated from God. And I don't think that all of a sudden a person like Jezebel is going to all of a sudden uh, be accepting of her faith that she's going to die soon. I think that person is going to fight to the bitter end. So, the idea of preparing for her death, I think, seems rather unlikely. What I do think she is doing is rather obvious. 
Uh, she's taunting the enemy. She's sure that this isn't going to be the end of her, so she's going to look as good as she can like she would on any other day. Maybe she's even planning on using her good looks and maybe even using her body, if need be, to get her out of yet another jam. This fits in with the vain character that we know of a person like Jezebel. There's even a phrase that uh, you may have heard somewhere through the years. <laughs> they call a person a painted Jezebel. I don't know if anyone ever heard that uh, before. This, of course, is a reference to a way that a, a woman would uh, paint up her face to cover up an ugly persona uh, underneath. Jezebel lived like she would never die. She lived arrogantly and selfishly. And imagine the shock that she would uh, experience whenever she was thrown from a window. She actually has one of the most unique deaths in all of scripture as she was thrown from a window by two officials in the king's palace. Now the next time you're at a party or a family gathering, you can show how smart you are in this way. You can use a big word that hardly anyone knows, and that word is defenestrate. Okay, they don't use the word in the Bible, but that's what happened. Now, back in high school, I dabbled a little bit in Latin, the Latin language. Um, I figured, why not learn a language no one speaks anymore? Uh, <laughs> so, it was actually helpful because it uh, teaches you some of these words that are in the dictionary, but no one ever really uses. And I learned that the word fenestra in Latin means window. So it follows that to defenestrate means to throw someone or something out a window. And I was surprised, first of all, that there was even a word for this. Apparently it happened enough that someone decided we're going to make a word for to throw someone out a window. But, so you can end up saying they defenestrated Jezebel. And whenever people look at you like you're talking another language, you can then explain that defenestrate means to throw a person out a window. And in the end, you probably want to avoid the whole thing and just say they threw her out a window in the first place because you save a lot of time in the process. But when people live their lives like Jezebel did, with no regard to God, the end for them is in many ways like that of Jezebel. In verse 32, we read two or three eunuchs who were working for the king, we realize was also working for Jezebel by extension, but when they had the first opportunity, they took advantage of that and killed her. When you treat people the way that Jezebel treated people, using them as pawns or stepping stones just for your own desires, you shouldn't be surprised that using people and manipulating them to get whatever you want is not the way to endear yourself to others. It's not the life of the Christian. And it certainly wasn't the life, or it was the life of Jezebel. People like her may act to your face like they're your friend, but their actions will always betray them. The shame is that people like Jezebel will never really have true friends on earth. And they won't have any place, uh, won't have any friends in the place where they are going to spend eternity as well. In verse 34, we see the respect or lack thereof uh, to, that Jehu gave to her upon her death. Now, if it were you, and if you witnessed such a violent, bloody death right before your very eyes, how do you suppose you would react? Would you say a quick prayer, may God have mercy on her soul, and uh, turn away from the sight? Well, look what Jehu did. It says he went in and ate and drank. He said, take care of that cursed woman and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. Now, I'm not always the sharpest tool in the shed, as they say, but I get the feeling that there's not any love lost here between the two of them either. I mean, if you can turn from such a gruesome scene and go in and eat a nice hearty meal, then you obviously weren't bothered by what you saw 
and you weren't emotionally distressed by it either. That's the lack of respect that Jezebel earned by the way she lived her life. And that's really the point right there. Jezebel earned everything that she got, especially in death. People say that God is not good whenever he sends people to hell, but they don't tell you that God gives people exactly what they ask for. The choice is ours all along. You either choose eternity with Jesus or you choose eternity without him. But you can never say that God is not good for allowing that person the option to choose. He uh, will allow you to go wherever you want. God never forces a person into heaven. If so, I would imagine heaven wouldn't be perfect like it is because you would have people who don't want to be there. And you may ask, well, who in the world would not want to go to heaven? You would be surprised. There are people out there who go around saying things like, I don't want to go to heaven because it's boring and I hate everyone who's in heaven anyway. I didn't like them on earth. I'm not going to like them then. And just these people exist out there. And for that reason, God's not going to force them into heaven. He gives them a choice where they want to spend eternity. Back to Jezebel. In verse 33, in rather gruesome fashion, it says, Some of her blood spattered the wall and the horses, and they trampled her underfoot. But worse, it says, when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. This was the fulfillment of Elijah's prophecy when he said dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's body will be like dung on the ground so that no one will be able to say, this is Jezebel. This, again, is a picture of a person who continually chooses to reject God. The fate of Jezebel in reality is representative of what happens to a person who's not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. The difference is that Jezebel's death is done and over in a relatively short period of time, but the torment that she and people like her face goes on forever and ever and ever for eternity. Whenever I think of how bad that must be, you know, eternity in hell, I then think of how great heaven must be on the other hand. And we all know the great hymn, Amazing Grace. Well, the line in there says, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. This, of course, is a picture of eternity with God, but have you ever thought, and I know it's a little bit morbid, but... Uh, I have thought this from time to time. While these people in heaven are experiencing 10,000 years of blessedness, there are also people in hell who are experiencing that much torture. And it seems as if their pain has just begun 10,000 years from now. Should be the most terrifying thing to ever consider, but this is why we need Jesus Christ. And it's why if there is someone that you know doesn't have salvation through Jesus Christ, you owe it to that person to at least tell him or her about Jesus and urge that person to accept his offer of salvation. That's all that we can do is tell them about it. We can't force them like God can't force them into heaven. But we can tell them that we know what eternity holds for the person who rejects the offer. So why would we not want to urge a, a person to join us with God in eternity? Salvation is not anything to play around with. And it is the ultimate life and death situation. We truly have the key that the whole world needs. Why would we be so selfish to keep it to ourselves? It reminds us that we as Christians need to be aware of the spiritual condition of those around us. Jezebel was a great example of this. You see, her death revealed her spiritual condition. All her life she spent on her appearance, 
her outward appearance, making herself beautiful, but it was nothing but a fraudulent covering of the spiritual bankruptcy inside. Right after she died, this woman who minutes ago was beautiful and would probably turn any man's head was now trampled beyond recognition by the horses, destroying this fake, pretty shell that she hid behind. And just as her body was trampled and destroyed, so she was spiritually trampled and destroyed on the inside. But the key to avoiding the eternity like Jezebel is to repent of our sins, to receive Jesus Christ into our life as our Lord and Savior. If you have not done that, I urge you to do that today. It is my prayer and my hope that everyone here has done that, so I hope I'm preaching to the choir, as they say. Be sure that you know where you're going after you take that last breath. Do what Jezebel never did. If you have repented and asked Jesus into your heart, then encourage others to do the same thing and repent of their sins. You know, a lot of times I hear Christians uh, they worry about being pushy with their faith. They won't want to drive people away. They don't want to be accused of being a Bible thumper, a religious fanatic, all sorts of things like that. I would agree with that person if the stakes weren't so high. Look at Jezebel. She never repented of her sins, and we see what happened to her, at least on earth, which is representative of what happens to her in eternity. We don't see what's happening to her right now as I speak, but we shudder to imagine it. Don't let people fall into this trap also of saying things like, well, I'm not as bad of a sinner as Jezebel was. I've never done those things. Or I've done bad things, but also look at all the good things over here I've done too. The Bible doesn't say if you're not as bad a sinner as others, you may be saved. It says it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Without faith, it doesn't matter how good or bad or not as bad as someone else you are. Our our faith is the most precious thing that we would ever be blessed with, and we should want to share that with everyone. Amen. We will encounter our share of Jezebels as we go through the world, as we go forth to serve God. But don't write that person off either as a lost cause if they aren't responsive to your urging. Amen. Jezebel didn't come to faith, but she could have. She could have repented, but she simply chose not to. God has given us a record of Jezebel in the Bible to teach us about the consequences of the way that we live our lives. So I want to leave you with a couple of questions this morning. Are you living for God, or are you living for yourself? Are you busying yourself by putting on the makeup of a Christian, to disguise something that is lacking in your spirit. It's all about repentance. People may not be following Jesus, but if they're still breathing, we cling to the fact that there is still hope for that person. They need to hear the truth of Jesus Christ and then let the Holy Spirit do his work. Amen. Most of the times, I give you what I think are rather uplifting and inspiring and happy messages, but the fact is that with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we also have to be realistic about it. Don't like to think of how it is in hell, but we need to realize that there are actual souls there right now. I think that in the Bible, that not specifically said in the Bible, but I do think that the idea is there that the people, the souls there right now, will hear the voices of those who have tried to share Jesus with them forever as a reminder of the love that God had for them by sending a witness or witnesses to them throughout their life. Because I think in hell they're going to have whatever can make it as bad as possible. 
and that memory of these opportunities that they had that they rejected will make it even worse for them. On the other hand, just uh, this last week I saw a cartoon and this was in the uh, days following the death of Billy Graham. This cartoon has St. Peter there at the gates of heaven and as Billy Graham is, comes up to the, the gates, St. Peter says, millions are here to thank you. You have no control over whether your voice is heard by a person in heaven or heard by, heard by a person in hell or is praised by a soul that's now in heaven. But your job is to simply make your voice heard. Let us now bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Our hymn of dedication is number 241, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.